Good afternoon, and welcome to the Foundation for Opioid Response Efforts webinar series on maintaining access to OUD treatment and recovery services during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Karen Scott, President of the Foundation for Opioid Response Efforts, or FOUR. FOUR is a national private grant-making foundation established in 2018 to support solutions to end the opioid crisis. As you all know, we're, seeing, we're increasingly seeing the ways in which the opioid crisis now intersects with the current global COVID pandemic. And over the past two months, four, um, at four, we've been convening expertise on what this means for the populations at the center of our work, as well as the providers who care for them. Today's webinar will focus on the role of peer recovery coaches uh, at this time. We've assembled an incredible panel to discuss both the impact of COVID on the functions of the peer recovery coach, as well as the impact of the pandemic on the individuals in these roles. We've had an incredible response uh, to this webinar topic, uh, which we really think signals the crucial role of the peers and the need for dis expanding this discussion. We're pleased to have all of you with us today. We will have two presentations, followed by a brief virtual fireside chat, and then open to our Q&A uh, with the audience, with all of you. So please be thinking about questions to submit to us um, for our, the end of our program. But first, as always, uh, we'll go over some quick webinar logistics. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be on our website shortly after the session ends. The presentation slides will also be available for download from our website. Please use the Q&A button found at the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, to, enter questions, uh, to enter your questions. If you see a similar question to yours, please use the upvote um, thumbs up button on the question and that will allow us to prioritize and get to the uh, questions that are of greatest interest. Uh, to all of you this afternoon. We'll read as many questions uh, live as time permits with our presenters. We will also create an FAQ document uh, with the questions um, and post on our website. Um, particularly, we do that so that we can address some of the questions that we don't get to during the webinar session. If you, in addition to the questions, if you have any resources on this topic that you would like to share with us and with, with the audience, please send them to us at info at 4FDN.org. Finally, there is also a brief feedback survey at the end of the webinar, and we'd greatly appreciate you taking a minute to complete that for us. Give us feedback as well as suggestions for um, additional work. Now, this slide may look to, familiar to many of you um, if you've been um, joining us for some of our prior webinars. Um, but just to say, we very much remain focused right now on expanding the information and resources on our website, as well as developing future funding opportunities and ways of communicating about the critical issues at the intersection of the opioid crisis and the COVID pandemic. So again, we welcome your suggestions for future webinar topics and other projects um, <clears throat> that we might uh, that we might pursue and develop, and um, and you can always reach us at info at fd uh, for foundation.org. We do have one new announcement today, and that is that we have just um, posted a new request for proposals. This is a um, a new grant uh, uh, RFP um, uh, 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 announcement. Um, that will focus on supporting some projects on recovery support services, particularly with a focus on how to continue support for recovery services in the context of the pandemic, social distancing, ex infection control, et cetera, and what the innovations are to keep um, patients and people in recovery connected. Um, in order to be responsive to the immediate needs created by the pandemic, we are accepting and will review proposals on a rolling basis over the next two months um, and make, uh, make our decisions as well on a rolling basis. Please go to our website for full details and requirements, but we look forward to some great ideas on how to keep people in recovery connected during this time. 
Now I'm very pleased to welcome our panelists for today. We have quite um, an impressive lineup. Um, we, um, our presentations will be led off by Professors Julia Felton and Jessica Magidson, um, respectively of Michigan State University and University of Maryland, also grantees of, of four will be followed by Professor Karen Fortuna um, of the School, Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. Um, and then we will have a small fireside chat um, panel discussion led by Ms. Sadie Smith, Chief Program Officer at the Mosaic Group in Maryland, along with Mr. Dwayne Dean, a registered peer supervisor at the University of Maryland, and Chris, Kirsten Centers Young, Director of Women's Services, Prevention Services at the Flint Odyssey House in Michigan. Um, very excited again uh, to welcome uh, everyone to this discussion this afternoon. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julia and Jessica. Great, thank you, Karen. Um, I'm gonna get us started. I'm Jessica Magidson. Uh, as Karen mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in the psychology department at University of Maryland. Uh, we're really excited for today's webinar, um, not only for the opportunity to present more of our research on peer recovery coaches, especially right now, um, but also this opportunity to bring together uh, some of the key stakeholders uh, in our work and some of our community partners. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide, please. So we're incredibly grateful to the FOUR Foundation for supporting our work. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I receive uh, support from NIH, including a HEAL initiative grant um, that I'll be talking a bit about today. Uh, next slide, please. So just very briefly as a background, um, for those of us uh, not as familiar with peer recovery coaching, um, when, when we talk about peer recovery coaches uh, or peer recovery specialists, these words can be used interchangeably. We're talking about individuals typically with lived experience with substance use disorder who are formally trained, uh, typically certified to support individuals in their recovery. Um, responsibilities vary widely um, in this role, but often can include linkage to treatment, uh, supporting motivation for recovery, navigating services, addressing barriers to care, um, as well as outreach. Um, you know, we know that peer services are certainly not new in substance use recovery or in mental health, uh, but this formal peer recovery coach role is, and certification of this role is what is more recent and has really rapidly expanded in the U.S. in the past few years. Um, peers can often reach underserved and marginalized communities with substance use disorder, which is particularly critical right now during COVID-19, which, as we know, uh, COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting underserved and minority communities. So, you know, during this time, peers can play a really important role, not only by uh, reducing social isolation, uh, identifying resources, providing support for recovery, but also by establishing trust and acting as a bridge with the healthcare system and being able to deliver health messages in ways that are relatable and trustworthy to uh, support recovery and potentially also reduce COVID-19 related risks. You know, we know that this work is certainly not without challenges right now in the context of COVID-19. And, you know, our team, we wanted to highlight today a few of the key challenges um, that may be facing peers at this time. And the first is, you know, identifying as people around the world are doing right now alternatives to in-person peer support, uh, including digital platforms for care delivery, supervision, and training. And we're really fortunate to have Dr. Karen Fortuna on the panel today, who uh, is a real expert in uh, digital peer support. Um, and our team is thinking a lot about platforms that are going to be feasible for low-income populations that may not have consistent access to technology. Uh, we'll also talk a bit in the panel um, later at the end of this webinar about reimbursement issues, as well as uh, self-care and supervision, which is, we know, incredibly important um, during this time. Uh, next slide, please. So just uh, very briefly, in terms of um, our kind of pre-COVID-19 peer recovery coach research. Our team um, at the University of Maryland and in collaboration uh, with Michigan State University has been leading a series of studies looking at how peer recovery coaches can support the opioid use disorder care cascade. And this has ranged from um, initiating, initiating medication treatment for opioid use disorder um, from community-based settings uh, to now our focus really being about how we can promote retention in opioid treatment programs. 
and you know in in general despite this you know rapid scale up of peer recovery coach programs that we've seen nationwide um, there's been a lot less research on the peer recovery coach role particularly outside the emergency department and you know we really need research to be able to understand what works and what strategies are most effective for peer models um, especially to be able to advocate for appropriate reimbursement and payment for this role and continued expansion of this role. So um, Julia is going to introduce our four foundation project next. I mentioned before, I also have an NIH funded project as part of the HEAL initiative. Um, it's part of the BRIM initiative, behavioral research to uh, improve medication adherence for opioid use disorder. And this project, we're evaluating a peer recovery coach delivered behavioral intervention to improve uh, retention in methadone treatment. And this work um, is in close collaboration with University of Maryland, Baltimore, and a large methadone program uh, affiliated with UMB. Uh, and this, this community where we're working in Baltimore uh, faces a significant burden of morbidity and mortality, not only related to opioid use disorder, but also uh, related to COVID-19, particularly among African Americans. So there's you know, a clear opportunity right now to leverage existing research studies and existing research infrastructure to test innovations in peer recovery coach models that may be going on right now that are emerging in response to COVID-19 that could potentially be sustained longer term. But we, know we really need to make sure that um, as we're planning for sustainability, we're not further excluding marginalized populations in these plans, especially when we think about telehealth models. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in, in thinking about how we're adapting our research protocols for COVID-19, we are um, you know, actively working to think about how we can be uh, adapting our approaches to be feasible in the context of physical distancing guidelines. So we're piloting a number of adaptations and, and constantly thinking about how to be most responsive. You know, the, the main area being how can we move our peer interventions to telehealth as you know i'm sure many people on this on this call are thinking through and you know one of our key priorities again is thinking about how can we do this in a way that we're making sure we're still reaching individuals without consistent access to technology we really want to think about right now how we can design telehealth solutions that are feasible um, you know that can also be sustained longer term so, you know, of course, relying on telephone only interventions without a visual component um, is is one option that it, that may be feasible. Um, but we're really thinking through how can we still have access to some of the visual components in our intervention that we often rely on. Um, we're, we're also considering at you know, potentially some telemedicine stations based at our partnering opioid treatment program that may um, allow individuals to virtually connect um, with a peer. And then another you know, key consideration that our team is thinking about is how can peers best support patients right now during rapidly changing guidelines for prescribing medication treatment for opioid use disorder during COVID-19? And you know, our, our notion of what retention and adherence means and looks like has fundamentally shifted uh, during this time. I'm sure as many of you are aware, um, there have been drastic changes in how medications for opioid use disorder are prescribed um, since about mid-March. Uh, SAMHSA and DEA have relaxed treatment guidelines and allowed, you know, not only for increased telehealth, but also increased uh, take-home and methadone medication that would have been extremely restricted prior to COVID. So, you know, for instance, our, our partnering opioid treatment program, uh, the majority of patients, over about 80% of uh, about 600 active patients, have transitioned now to at least two weeks of take-home medication. So, you know, there are a lot of new questions we're exploring around how can, it, how can the peer recovery coach role best support retention and care uh, when the challenges and, and barriers to retention have fundamentally shifted in a very short period of time. Um, and then, you know, my final point, and then I'm going to turn it over to um, my collaborator, Dr. Julia Felton, but my final point is just to emphasize right now, especially for people implementing new models and new innovations on the line, is, is just how important data collection is right now so that, you know, anything good that may be coming from this pandemic, any positive changes um, and innovations in the peer recovery coach role could potentially be sustained um, and financed following COVID-19.
So I'll pause there. I want to turn it over now to um, my close colleague and collaborator, Dr. Julia Felton. Thank you so much. Um, if you don't mind forwarding the slide, great, thank you. So um, the R4 grant is focused on understanding how to develop and disseminate training and supervision models that would promote the use of evidence-based interventions among peers to increase retention and in medication for opioid use disorders, specifically among low-income, minority-majority urban areas, which have seen a disproportionate increase in opioid use in the past five years, but still are less likely to receive access to evidence-based services. Um, as part of this project, we're working with state-level payers to better understand the patchwork of reimbursement models for peers across the country and within our performance sites in Michigan and Maryland. Um, we're also conducting a multi-site clinical trial in community and treatment settings in Detroit and Baltimore, um, two cities that have been really hard hit by the opioid use uh, crisis. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and while health disparities in access to care have been evident preceding the epidemic, as just mentioned, these were further exacerbated by COVID-19. Um, so within Michigan, where I'm located, Black Michiganders are dying at five times the rate of white Michiganders. And in Detroit, our death rate has outpaced even New York City, which was further complicated by the low levels of testing, which persisted through mid-May. Um, and we have seen that these disparities are also disproportionately impacted the agencies serving low-income and predominantly African-American clientele. So because of this, we saw a need to better understand how the pandemic impacted the work of peers and their ability to continue outreach and engagement to clients serving as that critical bridge linking individuals with OUD to care. Next slide, please. Um, so to that end, we reached out to several of our community partners and stakeholders and began recruiting peers and agency leadership to take part in qualitative interviews with a focus on understanding the impact of the pandemic on peers, their work, and patient recovery within low-income urban areas. Um, so we're really just getting started with this work, um, but to date we've collected about seven interviews, all in Michigan so far, and we're um, looking to expand our recruitment to Baltimore and other urban areas. Um, and as I mentioned, we're still in the beginning of trying to understand the impact of the pandemic, and we're also in the process of recruiting. So we wanted to mention today that we're really open to feedback and participation, especially from our many colleagues here through the FOUR network. So please do be in touch with us if you have any feedback or would like to be involved, because we want to make sure that uh, we're getting at the most important themes that you may be seeing with the populations that you work with. Um, so again, while we're still at the very beginning phases of this work, we did conduct some rapid qualitative coding in order to present on some of our preliminary findings here today. So we wanted to share with you some of the themes that we've started to see emerging from this work. Um, and one of the striking things that we've learned from peers is how difficult it is to reach people with OUD during the pandemic across settings. And we know from other research that peers are uniquely suited for outreach. So I think it speaks to the specific challenges of this pandemic and the need to stay at home, stay away from other people, fears of seeking medical services, that we've seen a drop off in client interactions and more barriers to meeting with and serving clients kind of across settings, including ED settings, court mandated treatments, and at OTPs. Um, peers have also reported a change in the role that they're playing. So one person mentioned he's now providing essential services, such as grocery delivery for his clients. Um, others mentioned that they're conducting a lot more virtual groups, and many are now seeing people exclusively through telehealth, all of which represent important shifts to the role that peers have played. Um, and with regard to uh, barriers to treatment and recovery during the pandemic, even in this preliminary work, we've seen a few common themes come up. So one of the big things that um, has been mentioned repeatedly by peers is the lack of interpersonal connection and physical touch. So the hugs, the high fives, the handshakes, and how difficult that's been for both patients and peers. There was a lot of discussion around the importance of the meeting before the meeting, or some of the more casual aspects of recovery that serve to create community, but have been lost with this shift to telehealth. Um, they also noted that technology barriers have been problematic with telehealth in that many clients lack the data plan, smartphones, or computers needed to connect. For instance, many folks use Starbucks or the library for Wi-Fi, and those sources are just unavailable now. 
um, or um, people don't always interact with the available technology in ways that facilitate tel telehealth. So not always answering phone calls consistently or feeling comfortable interacting with tech or even being tech phobic, which was a phrase we heard several times. Um, several peers also noticed that they didn't feel that their training really prepared them for this shift and that they were aware of trying not to fall into a role where they're just talking at their client, but weren't always sure how to create interpersonal connection at a distance. And finally, the agency leadership that we spoke with noted concerns about the impact of loss, anxiety, and trauma on peers' own recovery and the need to support peers through continued supervision, peer-to-peer -peer support, and trauma-informed organizational practices. So peers also did notice that there were several changes that, they, changes that they felt may improve access to care. So specifically, peers mentioned that some clients have reported better access to MOUD through deliveries and other non-traditional methods of accessing MOUD. Um, they also noted that among peer communities, there's been a general uptick in the support. So almost universally, peers mentioned that they're receiving um, more supervision and that there's been an activation of these more informal peer support networks that have been helpful for sharing resources. They also know that there's been an expansion of technology available to clients and that the movement of telehealth has meant that virtual NA and AA meetings are really widely available. So, so a few of the things that um, folks mentioned wanted to see sustained um, was they also noted that for some clients, um, telehealth has really uh, led to a level of convenience and comfort that's actually increased their engagement. So for some people, this has been a really um, important and helpful tool. Um, and that finally, several peers noted that the additional access to supervision and support has been helpful in navigating the pandemic related changes. So this expansion of supervision is really a central goal of our current four grant and one of the avenues that we're hoping to further explore in future qualitative and empirical work. Um, so that leads us to our next speaker, who I'm really excited to introduce. Dr. Karen Fortuna is an assistant professor at Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth College, and her research focuses on developing and implementing digital peer support programs. So I'll turn it over to her now. Great. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Fortuna. I'm an assistant professor of psychiatry at Dartmouth College, and I work with peer support uh, globe that uh, in older adult peer specialists, forensic peer support specialists, recovery coaches, um, and traditional mental health peer support specialists. And together, uh, we developed a partnership in which uh, we work with peer and non-peer academic scientists to develop um, products uh, for individuals um, to address problems within specific communities of patients or service users. And some of the products we've developed uh, is a smartphone application called uh, PeerTech, and also we've developed a very cool uh, international digital peer support uh, certification as well. So thanks everyone uh, for having me here today. Looking forward uh, to um, talking about some radical innovations in digital uh, peer support. Uh, if you don't mind going to the next slide, please. So today I'm gonna to talk about the history of digital peer support. I'm gonna speak specifically to uh, substance use and also mental health. Then I'm gonna talk about the service delivery benefits uh, for both mental health challenges and substance use as well. The very uh, innovative digital peer support technologies that are available, current challenges in digital peer support, uh, and then I'll speak to the uh, peer and academic uh, partnership uh, that we have together with a, a, our global team and talk about our certification in which we have 1,550 peer support specialists uh, across the globe um, uh, providing uh, digital peer support uh, to folks. And then also a very cool database uh, that we have developed as well. So if you don't mind just going to the next slide, uh, please, for me. Great. So the history of digital peer support is something that is not new. While, uh, while there was a, a rapid uptake of this literally overnight uh, in uh, March, um, this has a history uh, back dating back to 2005 for mental health challenges and also 2008 
uh, for substance use challenges. Uh, we see this expanding uh, to Australia seven years later. When we think about the, the global history of digital peer support or even peer support, it's actually a very old history in the United States, while in other places like Australia and Europe, um, the history, it's, it's newer, uh, which also leads to really exciting um, uh, philosophies and practice standards that are a bit different uh, overseas than they are in the United States. Uh, you mind going to the next slide, please? So we did a national survey of peer support specialists. And so this includes, you know, recovery coaches, also uh, traditional mental health peer support specialists, older adult peer support specialists. And we spoke with uh, 267 individuals across 38 states in the United States. And uh, we found out that the majority of them did own a smartphone application. Um, and so uh, we see a very cool age range of 21 to 77 years old, meaning that um, many older, uh, many, uh, many peer support specialists do have smartphone applications. And this is a great way that people can deliver services, whether it's telephonic peer support or it's port using smartphone apps or text messaging for people. This is something that people have. We also know that service users or patients, 85% um, of them also own smartphone applications. And so this is one way that we can actually deliver uh, digital peer support technology services to individuals. And rapidly overnight, um, when the COVID-19 crisis hit, um, what people were doing, they were going to close their doors um, until they discovered, discovered this. And one of the people provide service telephonically or also even Karen, video Karen, Karen, this is Karen Scott. Hi. Um, you were, you're, we're losing you a little bit and breaking up. Maybe okay. You your mic. Sure. I'll try here. Let's let me know if that works. And if not, I could call in. Okay. All right. Let me know if this works over here. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so I was just talking about a national survey of uh, peer support specialists, a oh, much better, great. And uh, so the majority of peer support specialists across the United States, uh, this also includes recovery coaches, they own smartphone applications. And we know 85% of service users or patients, they also own smartphone applications. So this is one way to deliver our evidence-based programs to individuals, whether it's text messaging, whether it's a telephone call, whether it's app, whether it's video conferencing through a smartphone. This is one way people can access services. Um, if you don't mind going to the next slide, please please. So the benefits of digital peer support. So one is that there's no geographical limitation. So you could um, be uh, in downtown Boston providing services uh, all the way up into areas like Framingham or rural types of areas. This is in Massachusetts. So there's no geographical limitations, especially among older adult peer support specialists that are uh, Medicare reimbursable for providing OUD services to other individuals? Um, they, there's no geographic limitations on that. Um, while if people are providing Medicaid uh, services to individuals, peer support services, the only limitation is that it has to be within your state. Um, we also know there's no time limitation. So the great thing about this is that sometimes there's uh, recovery narratives um, that people can watch on YouTube and people can access that at 3 a.m. if they need to. Um, people can go onto a smartphone app, a peer-supported smartphone app, you know, at 10 o'clock at night if they need to. So there's no time limitations. What's really exciting now is that the United Nations just called for, um, you know, community-based supports um, uh, available for individuals. And we know one of the most exciting things about digital peer support right now is that it engages service users outside of clinical environments. And so we know that with substance use and mental health challenges, it isn't a one hour a week between 1 and 4 p.m. within a clinical center that somebody uh, needs uh, support services or evidence-based practices. It's out there in the community while people are living their lives um, and maybe around some of the triggers that may um, promote uh, substance use or mental health difficulties. We also know it expands the reach. And so there could be uh, traditionally peer support specialists will offer services to individuals to maybe three or four people during one day. Now we're hearing that peer support specialists can reach up to 40 people in one day. So it's expanding the actual reach of our services. 
And what's really exciting too, it increases the impact of peer support without additional in-person sessions. So we actually have a smartphone application um, called PeerTech uh, that will be commercially available in six months from now, developed with peer support specialists. And we adapted that from a 12-month evidence-based curriculum, and we made it into a three-month program um, and made it into recovery language so people would use it. And we actually got similar results from the 12-month program for a three-month peer-supported smartphone application, which is super exciting. Also, you can access hard to reach groups such as rural residents, homebound older adults, or homebound adults and older adults, and also people experiencing homelessness, and also people who are hearing were able to use technology to reach them as well. Next slide, please. Great, thanks. Um, and so some of the benefits, um, and so the great thing is that on the left-hand side here, we see traditional telehealth uh, clinical practice. So this could be your psychiatrist, your psychologist, um, uh, and it generally peer support augments that type of care. Um, and we see that within the traditional uh, telehealth clinical practice, uh, people provide service, uh, services in psychiatric centers, primary care places, but digital peer support offers services within all of those um, locations. And we know that um, the evidence suggests that the key benefits are improved mental health symptoms, increased quality of life, decreased burden on the medical system. It also leads to reduction in risky substance use behaviors and also high levels of satisfaction among people um, who uh, use substances. And within that too, we see a major engagement in services. And so what's happening now is that scientists have been uh, developing digital therapeutics or technologies um, for people with substance use disorders, um, but people aren't using them. Um, generally people will use them for about two weeks and then they no longer use them anymore. Um, we found with our research based on the systematic review on the next slide I'll show you, um, we found that uh, digital technologies that are developed with peer support specialists um, as equal partners actually lead to the highest levels of engagement, um, which is really exciting. So is digital peer support effective? This is related to mental health. And so yes, it promotes hope, quality of life, empowerment, social support, recovery, also enhances functioning, also leads to reduction in mental health symptoms and improves engagement in services. This was a global systematic review that we did. Happy to share that with people if you're interested in reading. Uh, then if you go to the next slide, we can see around mental health uh, use challenges. Again, this is another global systematic review. Basically, we took all of the peer reviewed literature out there and by peer in this sense, I actually mean the scientists were reviewing that um, of all the um, digital programs that are out there uh, for uh, substance use challenges and it leads to reduction in risky substance use, uh, high levels of satisfaction and perceived benefit and engagement in services. And note, none of these studies have actually looked at the impact of digital peer support on peer support specialists. And so we actually have a, a study um, coming out or results coming out where we, um, we train digital peer support specialists who also included recovery coaches. Um, and we looked at the benefits of the program for them as well. Uh, and so it increases hope, quality of life, social support, empowerment, and you know what too, it also uh, decreases feelings of loneliness among peer support specialists as well. So imagine um, that impact on the, on the actual um, treatment system as well and costs associated with mental health and substance use challenges. Uh, do you mind going to the next slide please? Um, so within digital peer support, technology is just the means for human connection. So you can use any type of uh, type of technology. Um, you can use virtual reality. You can use video games. You can use smartphone applications. You can use computers. You can use telephonic peer support. It's all about the human connection uh, between the two individuals. And so within this connection, you can also train peers to offer evidence-based practices. Uh, for one of which we have a cool program where we integrated uh, acceptance and commitment therapy um, uh, for uh, peers who uh, ex or service users or patients who experience pain um, and who are using um, opioid. And we found that there's a reduction in levels of pain as the, as the peer support specialist who also ex was experiencing pain was providing um, acceptance and commitment therapy to another individual. And that's an early, um, that was one of our studies that's coming out in probably about three months, which was very, very exciting for folks. So within technology, 
It's a means for human connection and also to taking it to the next level to deliver evidence-based practices that are focused on recovery principles. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so there's different types of digital peer support. Uh, you have informal groups uh, like Facebook groups, then you have peer delivered uh, programs and support it with technology. Um, and then you have telephonic and also video uh, uh, videos as well. Um, and uh, we'll share the systematic review to share all of these different types of technologies that are available out there. Um, do you mind going to the next slide, please? So the role of peer support specialists in the digital era, we wrote a really cool article with our colleagues, Dr. Dan Fisher and Dr. Pat Deegan, which are leaders in the disability rights movement. Um, and so the role is really um, to, um, uh, one, address the social determinants of health, um, because a psychiatrist may just focus in on medications, a psychologist is gonna focus in on symptoms, but a peer support specialist is gonna focus in on everything around that person. Let's say somebody is trying to reduce using substances. Well, if they're gonna lose their housing, it may be very difficult um, to do that. And so a peer uh, would be able to, um, you know, address those issues of housing to help mitigate a person's risk for using substances later on. Also too, within the digital technology, peers are the number one way to get people to engage in digital therapeutics. And so there's a lot of uh, interest in that as well. Next slide, please. Um, and so some of the challenges are related to affordability um, for individuals um, for getting smartphone applications and also training in this area too is really, really big. And so uh, we'll go on to the next slide and I'll talk about the training that we've done um, and so here's the peer and academic partnership where we work with individuals and our partnership includes engineers, service users, scientists, policymakers, clinicians, peer support specialists. They're part of the entire projects that we make. And these are not only research projects, but they lead to really cool smartphone applications and a very cool training that we have a certification that we developed. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of which is this really cool uh, digital peer support uh, database that we have of peer support apps that meet standards uh, for individuals, uh, for peer support uh, specialists, and I'll send out the link uh, after that. And so it's really hard because there's tens of thousands of apps out there. So how do you pick one that's, you know, right for you? Um, and so we have this cool app database uh, for folks, and I'll send out the link after my presentation. And then the next slide, please. Great, and so here's the digital peer support certification that we have. Um, it's found to be an effective knowledge translation that is shown to increase peer support specialists, older adult peer support specialists, forensic peer support specialists, recovery coaches, uh, increase their knowledge, confidence, and capacity to use digital peer support in practice. Um, and so here are the cool things that we go over. This was co-designed uh, with peer support uh, specialists, and this really helped people keep their virtual doors open, especially during um, especially during the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. And so this is, we translated this into a four hour certification for folks. And the, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that we've trained uh, 1,550 peer support specialists globally, um, all throughout the United States here, a uh, few places in Europe um, and uh, New Zealand as well. And the blue um, shows that uh, we're training the entire states um, in this digital peer support um, certification to help people uh, keep their doors open. And I think that last slide, please. Uh, and so here's the certification and training process, but in the interest of time, I won't go over that, but I will provide additional information if you, if you need it following up after this. We have a website called digitalpeersupport.org. Um, the last slide. This is on our smartphone application uh, that we uh, developed uh, with our team that shows some pretty cool uh, improvements in people with a lived experience of mental health conditions and also substance use challenges. Next slide. All right, and so I'm going to uh, pass it along to Ms. Sadie Smith to lead a panel discussion. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate that, and I'll put the link in the chat. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Karen, and good afternoon, everyone. This is Sadie Smith with the Mosaic Group. And just to give you a tiny bit of background, we are a national consulting firm with expertise in community and behavioral health interventions. Since 2006, we've helped hundreds of practices with behavioral health integration. And in 2016, we created our reverse the cycle model, which incorporates universal screening of patients in emergency departments. 
with a team of peer recovery coaches that provide brief interventions and referrals to treatment, as well as an overdose survivors outreach program and medication assisted treatment initiation in the emergency department. As part of our COVID-19 resp COVID response, we have been developing newsletters for the peer workforce that come out twice weekly. And I will make sure um, as we wrap up our question and answer period that I put in our website into the chat feature so you guys can access our newsletters there if you're interested. And I am joined by um, Dwayne Dean, a registered peer supervisor. He's internationally certified as well as Maryland state certified as a peer recovery specialist. And he's currently an interventionist and peer advocate for the Global Mental Health and Addictions Program at University of Maryland College Park. And Kristen Centers Young, who's the Director of Women's Specialty and Preventative Service, Services at Flint, Saginaw and Port Huron Odyssey Houses. And she spent the last 20 years working with substance dependent pregnant postpartum and parenting women and their minor children. So I'd like to start with a question really as we get back to um, the topic of this webinar. Um, for Dwayne to start, Dwayne, what do you see as the most important role for peer recovery coaches for individuals with opiate use disorder during COVID? During the COVID pandemic, I think one of the most important roles right now for a peer recovery coach or specialist is simply to be content, continue being an advocate and a tier leader uh, and to uh, do wellness checks. Um, those are some of the most important roles at this time that I've seen uh, be beneficial and simply just sustaining uh, just a sense of uh, sanity uh, um, during this pandemic right now. Mm -hmm. And Kristen, with your um, team, um, in Michigan, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing peers right now? Here we go. Um, one of the things is, I think, is the shift to connecting through technology. Not all of our peers, um, again, are used to being able to um, utilize Zoom as part of their daily activities or um, are even familiar with telehealth. And so that was a whole new world. So their learning curve was pretty steep um, as they were working to engage the people they were working with who had just the steep of the learning curve. Also keeping up with so many policies. Um, I, I jokingly check the number of executive orders that Michigan puts out um, daily. And um, we've had several, over a hundred. And so it's one of the things too is that we have peers that are scrolling through databases that are attempting to um, translate um, information that's coming from their different systems and uh, trying to help the people that they're working with navigate these systems so that they they're learning just a little bit more and a little bit faster than the people they're serving and i think that's been the biggest struggle that they've had mm -hmm. and to sort of piggyback off of that kristen can you discuss the status of the Michigan reimbursement rates related to peer coaching and what might be sustained in the future? Well, right now we are able to, um, there's a special modifier to be able to use telephone and other mechanisms other than telehealth to connect. And so um, they are able to utilize under the Medicaid billing, um, being able to just have phone calls and um, or to be able to connect through FaceTime, for instance, which I thought was creative. Um, however, that allows for some boundary issues to come up that no, just because somebody contacts you on Facebook at 3 a.m. doesn't mean you have to answer. But um, that's going to expand 30 days past the emergency declaration. And so there's some of that that I hope that we'll be able to continue because I do think with our specialty populations, um, specifically our pregnant and postpartum moms, um, they're awake at different hours. They're, they're sort of homebound anyway. There's some limitations on how quickly they can get anywhere and some of the things that are happening around them and being able to just have a quick 15 minute phone call when you're a new mom, I think is something that um, is going to help with that engagement. And I'd love to see that continue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Dwayne, Kristen touched on this a little bit, um, but what considerations do you want to make peer supervisors aware of for their peer coaching workforce during COVID-19? 
the anxiety level is really high right now for peers, uh, just simply being a peer supervisor. Uh, we enacted uh, RAP in a workplace with this wellness recovery action plan. And this is simply checking in, uh, again, with doing wellness checks uh, because we, here's our people in long-term recovery from substance abuse and or mental health. Uh, you wanna make sure that they're maintaining their, um, their recovery program and that they're sustaining so that they're able to uh, work with the peers that, I mean, I'm sorry, work with the participants that they uh, that need their help. So I think that's something that's very important right now is just keeping an eye on each other. Um, being a resource broker uh, in, in these times, just being a resource broker itself has uh, changed tremendously in the last couple of months where um, you have a large percent of the resources that's no longer, that's not available or temporarily unavailable and um, just uh, as someone mentioned earlier, uh, we have people that's gone out and help people with groceries and things of that nature. So it's been a shift even in the resources that we use. So just education, uh, being, inform um, being informative, and simply those wellness checks are very are super important in the community. Yeah, I encourage people to do wellness checks on their team members as well as themselves. Um, so as we wrap up, I want you guys both to answer a question for us. We can start with you, Dwayne, just in regards to what changes do you want to see sustained post-COVID? Post-COVID, I would love to see the just the different platforms uh, for digital peer support um, be continue to be utilized because you're able to reach a broader audience um, and not just in your region. Uh, we're able to... Uh, render care or offer help in so many different uh, arenas, uh, just being able to do it digital, digital, digitally. Uh, and the one thing that I don't want to stop seeing or I would like to see post-COVID would be uh, the return of the face-to-face. -face. Um, even though the digital is awesome um, and it, it works very awesome, uh, I don't want to lose sight of the being a, the relatability factor of being able to be face to face with a, a, a. Yes, thank you. And what about for you, Kristen? Uh, one of the things I'd like to make sure that we don't lose is again that face to face, but also the celebrations that happen. Um, we do, for instance, baby showers for um, moms in our. Uh, Enhanced Women's Specialty Services, which is coaching for that pregnant and postpartum population. And just to be able to have that experience of celebrating a drug-free birth um, as a group live, um, I think is, is just one of those moments that um, I don't want to lose and I don't think you can capture digitally. Uh, but I also um, appreciate the idea of being able to have, for instance, the phone calls. I love the idea of being able to have, um, rather than telehealth, just telephonic supports and being able to continue that um, is one of the things that I think it's reasonably secure and that we should be able to allow that. Great. Thank you both for your time. And I'm going to turn us back to Karen to navigate our questions. Great. <laughs> Sadie, Dwayne, uh, Dwayne and Christian, thank you uh, so much for that uh, for that frontline insight. We um, I want to thank the audience. We have an incredibly robust um, discussion and, and sharing of resources and a great number of questions. Um, and um, we will um, we will do our best to get to a few of them now. Um, I, I'm going to start with one that's a little bit of a, the terminology and level setting and, and maybe um, just turn back to you, Julia or Jessica. Are recovery coaches different from peer support specialists? Jessica? Yeah, I think, you know, this term does tend to be used inter interchangeably and confusingly a lot. Um, I'd be curious to hear from uh, Duane and Sadie their input, but my sense is, you know, state by state in terms of uh, the certification programs, uh, this often dictates what term is used. For instance, I recently moved to Maryland from Massachusetts, and in Massachusetts we had, uh, we utilized peer recovery coach, that terminology more, whereas in Maryland the certification tends to focus more on peer recovery support specialists. So I think um, in general this does tend to uh, be used interchangeably, but Sadie and Duane, I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on this. Sadie? Yeah, I was going to defer to Duane. I, I agree um, with what Jessica indicated, and I think 
um, you know, there's terminology in terms of recovery coaching without using the term peer. There's terms in, um, in regards to peer recovery support specialist um, and really where, where that sort of lands within the mental health realm or the substance use realm. Um, and so a lot of times the terms are interchangeable, but in, in Maryland where we are from, it does indicate a certification level when you're um, a peer specialist. Great, and Duane, anything to add? Um, yes, and, and I've heard it's um, stated different in different arenas or different states. Um, and those are some of the things that are being looked at. One, because of stigma around certain words in, in, in the uh, mm -hmm. job description or the terminology. Uh, but two, yes, creating a ceiling. So they're using, they're starting to create a structure for how we use coach and um, specialists, especially in Maryland, that they're trying to raise the ceiling for peer recovery work. So they're looking at coaches to be uh, someone that is not certified on a specialist is being a certified peer specialist is someone that has uh, taken a state test. Now, because there's other entities out there that are certifications, I don't know how, I'm excited to see how that'll play out. For me, um, I do the work of a peer recovery coach. Um, and to me, it's, it's, it's that simple. I do the work of a peer recovery coach. Um, so coach, specialist, advocate, uh, support, it's to me it's all the same thing but i guess it depends on who you talk to thank you sure hi everyone this is karen fortuna so i i'm on the board of the international association of peer supporters which recently changed its name to the national association of peer supporters so we represent uh well the, the organization represents you know peer support globally and actually one of the uh, missions of uh, the the National Association is related to these different um, uh, terminologies. Um, and so we're actually trying to develop one terminology uh, for all individuals, but um, uh, called peer support specialist, no matter if you're a recovery coach, a certified older adult peer support specialist, forensic peer support specialist, there's so many different ones, but just as uh, Julia and Jessica said, it is state um, determined based on the, um, the certification uh, requirements. Thanks, Karen. Terrific. It looks like that that need for standardization goes along with with standardizing the training that you described as well. So, mm -hmm. progress. Um, we had a question early on. Uh, maybe I'll go back and start um, at the top with uh, with Julia and uh, or Jessica on. Uh, do you have any advice from Medicaid agencies on how they could better facilitate peer services during COVID? Julia. Um, I'd be really interested to hear Karen's answer on this, actually. <laughs> um, I, I hate to, to, but I'd love to, to, to turn over my time to her. Great. Okay. Um, Karen? Actually, uh, thank you. So, so um, actually, what we're doing now, we're working with um, states uh, with a peer liaison for each state. So 46 states throughout the country uh, have, have certified uh, peer support specialists, whatever the recovery coaches or whatnot. Um, and we're working with states to enhance their competencies to include digital support around competencies around work and personal competencies around performance. Is, um, and uh, which is really exciting too that we're actually working globally with our partners in Europe and Australia to develop international digital peer support standards uh, so they can take that within to um, their state agencies um, on the globe and so I'm happy to you know share those resources uh, with um, you know whoever the individual was asking that question and we're also working with the VA too. Great. And I think, you know, this is Jessica, we also, you know, have to have, uh, you know, Medicaid support in terms of being able to bill for peer services, whether it's in person or digitally, and at least in the state of Maryland, we're behind on that. So I think that's a number one priority. Great. Thank you. It's certainly an important place to start on the reimbursement. Um, we also had a couple of questions, though, asking about on the commercial insurance side um, and uh, what... Um, what you're seeing uh, in terms of commercial insurance being uh, facilitating uh, peer support services. Um, I still go back, uh, uh, Julia or Jessica on, on that one or? 
I'll open that one up. Uh, Karen or Sadie? Um, sure. So we're actually working with two large um, health systems right now um, in the area of revamping, not revamping, but redesigning their services so they could provide um, digital peer support services now. A lot of health organizations, pretty like amazing, huge ones are, they have integrated peer support specialists uh, alongside clinical staff. And then uh, we're currently working on the shift, at least within two large healthcare organizations now. Great, thank you. Great. Um, there was a question about uh, the HIPAA compliance issue. Um, I've been recently encountered uh, within my organization that I'm not allowed to text my patients because it's not HIPAA compliant. Uh, we know there have been a lot of temporary uh, changes um, to those to the usual regulations. Um, uh, Karen, uh, from the digital perspective, maybe if you have a comment response on that. Yeah, sure. So every um, organization, uh, so there are national requirements set forth due to the COVID-19 crisis uh, that has kind of uh, made it so there is less uh, restriction around HIPAA. However, since, you know, our team has been talking to senators around the country and, and we're seeing that peer telehealth is likely here to stay. We're encouraging people to purchase um, technologies that are HIPAA compliant, um, and it's really up to the agency. So while your agency says you can't text message, it's interesting because another agency uh, would be able to text message. So it's really up to um, those places, but we recommend purchasing technology that is HIPAA compliant, knowing this is gonna be here to stay. There are HIPAA compliant text messaging apps uh, that are available. There's also, you know, Zoom for Healthcare, which is also HIPAA compliant. Um, and yeah, and I could refer folks to the website um, on that. And there is a, a cool question, like, will digital peer support be as popular? You know, and I, I do wonder about that. We do see it as an integrated system where I think um, Dwayne was talking about too, like it will be digital, like that will be here to stay, but we'll still have that in person as well, um, but maybe offering those augmentatively towards each other. Actually, that's a perfect segue, um, Karen, thanks to uh, an additional question, which I'll, I'll direct to, to Dwayne and Christian, um, which are, what are your thoughts on a hybrid group? Some folks want to come back, but others are, are not comfortable yet. So. This way, those who want to come back um, can, and 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 others can can join by Zoom. Um, any reactions to thoughts on how that might work um, from your experiences, uh, Dwayne, and then Kristen? Yeah, I can. I see as far as some of the uh, twelve step or some of the different pathways that are using uh, Zoom and and doxing me and Skype and things of that nature. And me personally with my own therapist, I use a doxing me. Uh, and I would rather sit in front of my laptop than take the 40 minute ride, <laughs> you know? Um, so I do think I do think a hybrid uh, uh, involvement of both digital and person to person. Uh, and it actually gives us more choices um, and in turn allow us to, again, reach more audiences on a more consistent basis because if I can't get you to come in, at least mm -hmm. you can stay home and I still can reach you. So I, I just see it as a benefit, a plus plus situation. Thanks. Okay. Christian? Well, one of the things we're seeing right now is in our recovery housing. Um, we're actually utilizing a, a hybrid version. And so uh, that's been working out really well. I think the biggest part of that is full disclosure um, to make sure that um, everybody who's in the room realizes that there is some um, risk, for instance, that somebody's recording the Zoom. So, I mean, there's, there's some basic technology security issues, but um, I also think that the population that we work with are young enough to be much more tech savvy than I am. Um, and so I would say that those are one of the things that the, um, the groups in themselves um, and the participants in themselves could really provide us with a lot of direction um, and solutions. So that mm -hmm. I, I look forward to see what's going to come from the recovery community as we move forward through this. I think that's a great um, note to uh, to close our, our webinar on. Thank you so much, Christian. Thank you to all of our presenters. We, we have, again, a large number of questions. 
we will um, collect uh, uh, additional responses and post those on our webinars. So we really thank all of the, the audience for incredible engagement today. You've also shared a number of resources and we will include those on our Q&A document so that uh, they're available to everyone along with links to some of the references uh, that our presenters um, have mentioned uh, during during the session. Um, again, we look forward to continuing to work and hear from, from many of you uh, on, as you continue to develop your work um, in this area of peer recovery supports for coaches. Um, uh, and we wish everyone a good afternoon. Uh, thanks again to my, to my presenters um, and my team. Um, and uh, everyone take care. Uh, and thank you again for your interest in your work. We look forward to talking with you again soon. Best.